Hello everyone, welcome to Biogis Classes. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about yesterday's prelims papers, history questions. We'll be discussing all the questions that were asked in history. But before I start discussing, let's look at the questions and look at the areas from where these questions were asked in this year's exam. Guys, this is set C. And if you look at the questions, questions were divided in five parts. Total 17 questions were asked from history segment, where maximum five was from modern, four each from medieval as well as art and culture, three from ancient, and one from post-independence. Three things come to my mind when I look at these numbers. Number one, last year there were around 22 questions that were asked. This year the number has come to 17. Definitely a shift towards lesser number of questions as far as history is concerned. Number two, look at this. One thing that clearly comes to my mind is that there has been a devaluation as far as modern history is concerned. The number of questions that are being asked from modern history has got substantially reduced this year and has been equally transferred in art and culture, ancient and medieval. That means from this year onwards, if we look at our focus in these three areas from the perspective of prelims, we would have to give good attention to medieval as well. Lastly, one more thing that I can see very easily, post-independence, Continuing the trend of last year, this year also has shown one question. Last year also there were two questions from post-independence, one being from the trade unions and another being from the areas like four events were given and we had to arrange them in the, the order in which they had happened. This year also there is one question of post-independence. So let's begin one by one. We'll start with art and culture, then we'll go into ancient history questions, then we'll go to medieval history questions, then to modern and finally to the post-independence question. I'm looking into set C and I'll be following that particular set. First question of art and culture. Guys, this is a question about Kalyana Mandapa and this is asking that which is a notable feature in the temple construction in which particular kingdom. Now, guys, I'm putting it as a moderate question. Of course, the question is art and culture, but comes from the art and architecture area. And they have given you the four kingdoms name. And why I'm putting it as a moderate question? Because if somebody knows the answer of this, that this particular Kalyan Mandapa, they are a notable feature of the Dravidian architecture, which was introduced by which of the following? Now, Chandelas are so North Indian kingdoms, where others are usually the southern ones. So Chandelas were the worst option out of these four. And the answer to this is Vijayanagar. So anybody who would be knowing about this, they would have got this answer very easily. Good examples of this are examples like temples of Hampi, the Vithal temple, where in the Dravidian architecture, the Kalyan Mandapas, which are the marriage ceremony halls, were constructed by the Vijayanagar kingdoms rulers like uh, Devarai two and all and further it was also constructed during the reign of Krishna Devarai the greatest ruler of this Vijayanagar dynasty so all these people had been instrumental in adding this particular feature this particular mandapas which had been constructed in many places Hampi being one example Vijay Vithal temple which is dedicated to Lord Vithal so all these are there so Again, I'm putting it as moderate because if somebody knew the answer to this, they would have very easily got to the answer D. If somebody had no idea about this, they would have got confused out of these four. But then it's a moderate question, not very tough, not very easy. And we always ask people that when it comes to art and architecture, you should always do five prominent chapters, one being architecture, another being painting, third being music, fourth being dance and some proper literature. You can see one question has come from art and architecture. Continuing this five only, you can see another question has come from music. And again, I'm mentioning it as a moderate question. Is moderate mainly on account of the fact that not correct. I've met students in the last one day who said that they got the question wrong mainly because they didn't see this word. 
it happens in the examination hall many 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 times we ignore this particular word we tend to not focus on the not thing now if you look at these four options first of all we all know tanseen was a great musician lived during the times of akbar one of his nor ratnas so there might be a tendency to think that maybe akbar would have given him this title okay fine enough look at number 2 tanseen composed dhrupads on hindu gods and goddesses now this is a clean cut correct statement there is no nothing wrong in this tanseen was known for constructing or composing many dhrupadas and he came from the gharana which was famous for this and he used to do this on the hindu gods as well as goddesses he invented many ragas for that we all know that it's known that he used to sing ragas according to the time of the day it was and this is also a correct statement and then he has composed songs on his patrons so based on my discussion with many students what i understood that people were mostly confused in a and d they were sure about that these two statements are correct b and c so they were confused whether this is wrong or this is wrong because they were not very sure about this word that did he compose song for his patrons so here i would tell you very clearly that guys akbar only gave the title mia mia tanseen to this particular great man he was one of the navratnas as i have already mentioned to you and he gave only this particular honorific title to him whereas the word tanseen was given to him the honorific title tanseen was given to him by the ruler of gwalior where he was initially based out of tanseen this particular name was not given by akbar to him he is a great indian musician from hindustani classical music who had started way back as early as at the age of 6 and in his time it was it was felt that only his guru swami haridas was equivalent to him nobody else was i am putting this as a moderate question mainly because of this and some confusion that may have crept between the a and d option otherwise he is famous musician of dhrupads ragas has been introduced by him and he has composed songs so the answer to this is none other but a moving ahead guys this was the second question of art and culture moderate third and this is easy comes from paintings what it is mughal paintings and talking about the mughal emperors that which mughal emperor has shifted the emphasis from illustrated manuscripts to album and individual portrait guys we always say that when you talk about different different mughal rulers for example when we are talking about the great mughal rulers starting from babur humayu akbar jahangir shah jahan and aurangzeb everybody had their own tastes these two men did not get a lot of time to establish themselves akbar was very much interested in religious affairs shah jahan very much interested in buildings aurangzeb doing or undoing everything that his great predecessors had done and finally jahangir was most interested as far as paintings were concerned in fact it is said that jahangir was such an accomplished painter himself that he could look at the painting and tell that who all were the painters who would have drawn this and himself you know i'll just quote you one example one of the historians mentions that a dying man was there he was almost about to die and jahangir instead of helping this man asked his painters to draw his picture to you know get the facial expressions correct so very clearly you can understand that this man was very much interested in individual portraits he was interested in albums and there is no bigger name when it comes to painting amongst the mughal rulers other than jahangir so the correct answer to this is none other but c moving ahead guys question number 98 of set c it mentions in which of the following relief sculpture inscription is ranyo ashoka mentioned along with the stone portrait of ashok now i have put it as a tough question and i am very sure why it is a tough question because guys 
it is something that you know or you don't know. If you know it, great. If you don't know, in ancient it happens, you will not be able to say. So if you have studied it deeply, if you have gone through the books prescribed, then you may have some idea about this. If you haven't gone through this, then it becomes very tough. It's a very factual question. Now, those who know, it would have been very clear that the answer to this was A. This is a site in the state of Karnataka where this Ranyo Ashoka, written as Rayo Ashoka, and it's written in Brahmi script. And as I mentioned, it's tough because there are stone portraits of Ashoka along with his queens here. And they are very old, of course, around 1 to 3rd century AD. But then this is a very factual question. If you knew it, great. If you didn't, it would have been tough. So that's why I have put it as tough. But then overall, if you look at the art and architecture or the total art and culture areas, guys, as we saw, there were four questions and only one of them was tough. One was easy, two were moderate. So depending upon your preparation, you could have got certain very easy questions here. Moving ahead, this time we are moving to ancient history. And in ancient history, guys, the question is again not a Harappan site. And I'm mentioning it as a moderate. It could have been easy also. Because look at the question, which is not Harappan site? Very easily, these two are Harappan sites. Every time we read about these two, Chanudaro and Kodiji, everybody knows. Lothal is there, Harappa is there, Mohanjudaro is there. There are so many such sites all across India. So there was no confusion about AB. If at all there would have been any confusion in the minds of the students, this would have been about these two options, C and D. And here also something came to my mind very clearly. That question 97, and look at the previous question, question 98, they both had Sohgora as a common option. Now, I'm not saying you could have deducted something. I'm only saying that somebody made the question paper in huge hurry. Now, the answer to this question is C, Sohgora, because other three are Harappan sites where Sohgora is a Mauryan site. And it tells about the stories about famine or the famine relief measures that had taken place during the Maurya era. Other, all three are, as I said, Harappan site and this belonging to Gujarat. So this was a moderate question. You could have easily eliminated A, B. You had to think about C and D. So this was first question of ancient. Guys, one thing to be very, very clear. Though they asked three questions from ancient, one question of ancient is coming from IVC, which is always a very, very important chapter as far as ancient is concerned. And then if we move to the second question of ancient, another important chapter of ancient has been asked Buddhism. And this I have marked as easy. Why I'm marking it as easy, guys? Because it is just asking about three features and they are they belonging to Mahayana Buddhism or not? Now, even if somebody would have done their NCRTs properly, very clearly the differences between Mahayana and the other sects of Buddhism are mentioned here. And if you look at the three points, deification of Buddha, trading the path of Bodhisattvas and image worship and rituals, it is very clearly all these three take part in Mahayana Buddhism. Now we all know, for example, Bodhisattva, a person who has already been enlightened, then we know they talk about the image worship, they worship the Buddha's image and there is deification of Buddha also. So I'm putting it as an easy thing. The answer is D. All the three points were correct. Good thing is ancient two questions are coming from two of the most prominent chapters of ancient. So not a tough area this year, ancient. Of course, the third question comes from Guptas and I've marked it as a tough question. Why I'm marking it as tough? Because it is saying, with reference to forced labor, that is Vishti, in India during the Gupta period, which statement is correct? And there were four points given. Now, here we had to eliminate. First of all, very easily these two could have been eliminated because, of course, it is about forced labor, but then they were not entitled to weekly wages. This is a totally wrong statement which was given. At the same time, the eldest son of labourer was not sent as the forced labourer. These two were very clearly wrong statements given. Whereas if you look at statement one, that it was considered as a source of income for the state, a sort of tax paid by the people, of course it was. 
basically the what used to happen is that the chhatriyas they used to obtain their percentage of the material surplus through different ways or through powers of arms and they were as kinds of taxes like there was shulk was there bali was there kar was there and this was also seen as a type of tax only so vishti might be there there might be balatum might be there both being forced labor so if you had gone deep you may have been knowing it but then i am mentioning it as a tough question but then the nature of upsc is if you know it's tough you could have left it one shouldn't have fallen in the trap of negative marking in such questions so ancient was this now the surprise package of this year was medieval because we all know last year there was one question from this segment this year there were four questions the first question that we are going to discuss the question about new world and old world and the plants that were domesticated guys many times this is the question or this is the chapter that is the arrival of europeans which we teach in the modern india also as a chapter 1 and there we talk about certain products which are mentioned here now if you look at this presently we will be answering the question as a but then this is slightly disputable maybe it may go for b also now guys if you have to understand that in this question new world and old world what is new world countries like america australia new zealand these are the new world which are the old world countries like india your iran these are the old world so the question is which one of the group of plants were domesticated in new world and then introduced in the old world that means let's say take example of india so was this crop in india or not that could be something that you had to think so based on our analysis we think cotton was known to us it was known in the indus valley civilization so cotton should not be an answer similarly cotton is here also so it should not be the answer now if you look at these two there is another thing wheat which was known to us we have been growing wheat for a very long period of time whereas if you look at these plants tobacco cocoa and rubber these were introduced by the foreigners who had come to india or to these countries that is the older world from the new world and they had introduced for example if we talk about portuguese they came up with potato so such things may have happened and presently according to our analysis a should be the answer that is tobacco cocoa rubber were introduced in the older world by the newer world i am putting it as a general knowledge question it is from arrival of europeans it's a moderate type question you could have done this thing and this way you could have come to the answer guys now the question of medieval history this time from delhi sultanate again i'm putting it as a moderate one mainly because three statements have been given the question is about ikta system about mir bakshi about officer named amil so basically those who would have gone through the administration during the medieval times whether it is mughal or with whether it is delhi sultanate would have been able to answer this because the third point the office of mir bakshi came into existence during the reign of khalji sultans is wrong it came during the reign of mughals so if you would have known this now only these two are left very clearly one is they are in both the options a and b that means one is correct that is amil was the in charge of revenue collection and this is during the delhi sultanate now only question was about point number 2 the ikta system now guys here there is slight ambiguity with regards to this point because most of the scholars feel that ikta system was introduced by these delhi sultans not something which was ancient it's not indigenous see we also have such systems that is land revenue was there in india from very early times but mentioning that ikta systems of sultans of delhi was an ancient indigenous institution is slightly a wrong statement because we cannot clearly say that this was ancient this was indigenous we have revenue administration we have revenue collection methods but then it was not exactly ikta though there might be some people who may feel that it was very closely resembling to ikta but for the sake of our 
purpose, we would be taking A as the answer. We would not be taking B. But then let's wait what UPSC says. Move to the next question, guys. In medieval history, we have the question from Sufi and Bhakti movements. I'm putting it as a moderate one. First line, Saint Nimbarka was a contemporary of Akbar. Nowhere close. Akbar is in 16th century, 15. 42 to 1605, whereas we have sent Nimbarka who is born around 12th century. So one is very easily removed. Number two, if we talk about Kabir, now Kabir is in 15th century, around 1440 he is taking birth. Whereas if we talk about Sheikh Ahmed Sarhindi, he is almost 120 years later, he is born in 1564. So there is no way that this man would have been influenced by this other great man. So again, this statement is also wrong. The answer would be neither one or two. Sufi and Bhakti movements are the most important chapter as far as medieval history is concerned. Of course, remembering who was at what period of time, where they contemporary, where they came after one another is a tough aspect. That's why I'm putting it as a moderate one. But then... People could have answered if they had gone through this chapter nicely. So answer would be D. Last question from medieval history from the Mughals with reference to Mughal India. They are asking about the difference between Jagiddar and Zamindar. Now if you look at the two statements, very easily what we could see was land assignments to Jagiddars were hereditary. Of course it's wrong. We are not hereditary. We know the Jagiddari could have been taken away. That means two is wrong. So now only thing that we had to keep in mind was one and neither one or two. Let's look at the first statement. Jagidars were holders of land assignments in lieu of judicial and police duties. Of course, till here it appears to be perfectly correct. Jagirdari, Jagir, property was given to somebody. Jagir was usually in those days in the form of land if they performed some duty for the king. What sort of duty? Judicial or police. Whereas Zamindars were holders of revenue rights. Yes, they used to collect the revenue for the king without obligation to perform any other duty other than revenue. So very correctly it has been specified. Nothing wrong in this statement. Jagir is property which has been given to you in lieu of the service that you have given. Zamindari is the officer who has been appointed to collect the revenue. So the answer to this is none but A. Moderate I am mentioning because medieval history is a part of history which we usually don't go into that deep. So I am mentioning it like this. But then let's see. If you look at medieval, you can see there were questions 4 and all the 4 have been mentioned as moderate ones. So no easy questions came from medieval. So let's see how we have performed and move to modern. In modern question number 84, I'm mentioning it as moderate. It's a Gandhian phase question. Guys, this question we should have gone through either point two or point three. Let's look at point two. In Lord James Ford's war conference, Mahatma Gandhi did not support the resolution on recruiting Indians for world war. Now, first confusion. Do I know that this war conference happened during Lord Chelmsford time? If you are confident, it is a correct fact. It is a correct fact that Lord Chelmsford had organized a war conference during World War I. So if you are confident about this, second question that comes to my mind, did Mahatma Gandhi attend this? Of course, he had attended this. At this point of time, Mahatma Gandhi had attended this war conference. And then it is mentioned the third thing, he did not support the resolution on recruiting Indians for World War. Now guys, here is a very big thing. Gandhi, who all his life has supported peace, had talked about that during World War, Indians should give uninterrupted supply and support to the Britishers and then they should expect something from them. This was the idea of Gandhi which he had carried. So the moment did not is mentioned. This is a wrong statement. Moment 2 is wrong. Only thing that remains is B. Answer is 1 and 3. If you cannot go through point number 2, let's talk about point number 3. It is saying, consequent upon the breaking of salt law by Indian people, INC was declared illegal by the colonial rulers. 
of course when we talk about the civil disobedience movement after civil disobedience movement had been started inc was declared illegal and all the tall leaders of inc had been put behind the bar in 1930 only to be released in the month of january 1931 when the talks between congress and british started to happen so point number three was a correct statement that means a would have been wrong because three is in all the other options look at point number one mahatma gandhi was instrumental in the abolition of system of endangered labor now guys this is a correct statement of course there were many other people people as great as madan mohan malviya was there who has been given credit for this but then gandhi also played a huge role and that's why we will have to accept that he was instrumental in doing this and that's how the answer would be b one and three only now guys we have a question which is based on persons and personalities i'm putting it as moderate anybody who has gone into the modern history properly would know and would know about all these people all these three people sapru keeps on coming because he is one man who is seen as a mediator between the britishers and the congress during those times if you talk about P.C. Joshi, one of the biggest names of Communist Party of India pre-independence days. And if you talk about K.C. Niyogi, he was a member of Constituent Assembly. The answer is all the three are correct. Of course, it was not that simple until unless you have good idea about all these three names. And whether they were, you know, president or member or general secretary or not. For this particular fact, you should have gone through the communist ideology or how did the left wing develop in India. As far as first point is concerned, that is All India Liberal Federation. Sapru was the most outstanding member of this body and he had been instrumental in many talks with regards to Simon Commission or the roundtable conferences and he was the president of this body. Again, I'm putting it as a moderate one answer was D all of them were correct another question that comes from constitutional development modern history third question I'm again putting it as a moderate one charter act of 1813 the easiest point here was one absolutely correct it has ended the monopoly of East India Company except for tea and trade with China that means B is not the answer number two it asserted the sovereignty of the British crown over the Indian territories held by the company Again, it's a correct statement. Nothing wrong here. They have asserted the sovereignty of the crown. That means two is also correct. Now only we have to think about the third one. Guys, the problem here is revenues of India were now controlled by the British Parliament. It's a ambiguous statement. It's wrong because not exactly the revenues did not directly go in the control of the British Parliament because still company was there and that's why if you look at any of the standard books none of the standard books are mentioning this statement very clearly that means we should not take it as a correct option and that's why we will be negating the third and the answer would be A move to the next question Swadeshi again I am putting it as a moderate though many would feel it's an easy question guys no doubt about two the National Council of Education was established as part of Swadeshi because the idea is that we would be boycotting everything of theirs. Of course, their schools, of course, their colleges. The moment we boycott their schools and colleges, we need something for our students. How would they be taught? What they would be taught? What all things they would not be taught? That's why it was established on 15th August. Correct. Two is correct. Two is correct. That means A and D is wrong. Now, number one. It contributed to the revival of indigenous artisan crafts and industries. Now guys, there is some ambiguity about this. No doubt, there were many industries which were established. Example being PC rays or many other smaller industries which were established. But did it lead to the revival of indigenous artisan crafts? Sumit Sarkar does mention it in one of his chapters on Swadeshi and mentions this statement has been lifted from that particular book. And that's why we would take it that... Of course, certain indigenous artisan crafts like uh, weaving, silk, all did get some sort of revival. So we will take one also to be correct and answer would be C. 
but of course a moderate question lastly again a question on person personalities and put it as easy all india anti untouchability league mahatma gandhi during his harijan movement after calling off the civil disobedience movement gandhi has clearly said his focus is going to be only on one thing great man self respect movement has been started by ev ramaswami naikar or periyar we study about him in our chapter socio religious reform movements lastly all india kisan sabha swami sajjanand saraswati in all chapters on peasants or on agriculture we do study all three are very prominent names very clearly very prominent organizations that's why i am putting it as easy an answer would be d so you can see five questions from modern history one being easy second moderate third moderate fourth moderate fifth moderate so one easy four moderate overall the focus is slightly less as far as modern is concerned and last question of this discussion comes from the segment of post independence history on land reforms i am taking it as easy why you can see first of all it is saying ceiling laws were aimed at family holdings and not individual wrong it was also aimed at individual holdings let's look at two major aim of land reforms was providing agricultural land to all the landless appears to be a good statement look at option c resulted in the cultivation of cash crops as predominant form of cultivation zero no no way this is correct statement absolutely wrong land reforms permitted no exemptions to the ceiling limits wrong there were ceiling limits so of course the answer is b that's why i put it as a very easy question the answer was very clearly b so if you look at the questions guys there were 17 questions from history of course good number of questions have come of course there have been easy some tough but then focus has been shifted from the traditional areas to non traditional areas i would urge you that looking at this we would have to slightly concentrate on non traditional areas like uh, medieval as well as ancient but then again if you look medieval and ancient the core areas have remained same but then we would have to focus on those core areas slightly more that was all about the discussion i hope the prelims had gone good well for all you people we would be bringing more analysis on the prelims paper in the coming sessions for the other subjects also that's all from our side thank you for watching us best of luck for your results for any help that you require for mains exams you can mention in the comment section we would be contacting you directly either mention your mail id or mention your uh, phone numbers we would be helping you out that's all from our side thank you goodbye